Welcome to another episode of the Peak Potential Success Show. My name is Wang Chua. I'm an entrepreneur, business strategist, real estate investor, speaker, and also a best-selling author. And every single day, I help others unlock potentials and guide them to succeed. Today on the show, we have another fascinating, amazing guest. On the show, we interview celebrities, entrepreneurs, business CEOs, athletes, and artists to find out their path to success, how they're able to overcome trials and tribulations, and of course, their keys to success. And today's guest is somebody who covers all those bases. From a celebrity to a star to entrepreneurship, he covers all those things. And I'm just very, very excited to have him here. Uh, when I was seeing that I had an opportunity to have him on my show, I was like, yes, when? Uh, tell me where and what time and all that kind of stuff, because I'm very, very excited, excited to hear more about his story and what he's been doing. Uh, he comes from a uh, very humble beginnings as a child refugee. Uh, from there, everything went sky sky high from international pop star to entrepreneurship to speaking he loves traveling around the world helping people find their purpose find the way they can impact more people find their creativity really mastering those core skill sets so that they can drive to succeed in any uh, in any industry in any type of uh, job or career that they so want to do uh, helping them live life exponentially so please welcome media producer speaker entrepreneur evangelist performance coach, and international pop star, Mr. Christian Ray Flores. Wow, that was a great intro. Thanks, Fong. I appreciate it very much. Hey, thanks for being here. Like I said, uh, it's not every day that an international pop star would go, hey, do you want me on my show? So yes, yes, yes. I'm I'm very, very fascinating about your, your past and then also very fascinated about what you do now because it's not every day where people go from international pop star singing and performing all over the world in front of thousands and thousands of people to now going out there and speaking and helping people achieve more success, achieve more greatness, uh, kind of relaying that type of experience to helping other people. Because most people go, okay, I'm singing, now I'm going to coach other people how to sing, do record labels and all that kind of stuff. But you kind of went a different path uh, that's a little bit more engaging with other people. So can you share with us that whole path and uh, why you do what you do now? Okay, so uh, at the risk of confusing people, I'm going to give you a very short summary of it uh, because I want to leave more time to really be able to maybe help in very practical ways, right? So I, I'm i a very international guy. I was born in Moscow, Russia. My dad's Chilean, so we moved to Chile when I was six months old. We ended up in the middle of this massive military coup. My dad was in a concentration camp. We were refugees there under the UN uh, sort of protection. And we ended up being exiled. And I grew up basically in four different countries by age seven. We ended up in Germany and then Africa. So I basically grew up in these very strange environments. A lot of change very multicultural. I had to learn four languages by age nine. And then on top of that, there's this layer of sort of social unrest, civil war, military coups, things like that. And to where it sort of ended up being is that I got back to the to Russia with my mom after my parents divorced. I got a really good education there in economics. And I wanted to do in, go into music. And as the country was sort of falling apart, um, in the early 90s, I was starting a music career and I became one of the top pop stars in Russia across all of that sort of sp span of 15 different countries that was the former Soviet Union. And that's basically the almost like the origin story, right? That sent me to a place of prominence, my first success. I was entertaining millions of people in all of that area, toured all over that, over that space. And basically after that, I... I was already producing other bands, so I went into into producing. Eventually, I sort of phased out of music because I wanted to do other things. Moved to the U.S. with my wife, Deb. She's American. All of my daughters were born in Russia and Ukraine. And then on the U.S. side, I worked a lot on in philanthropy because I was very interested in it. We and started several companies, a couple of nonprofits, several companies. Basically, where where am I now? Am I now? I am. Um, I have an after school academy in Mozambique where I grew up. So this is sort of my philanthropic effort to give back to to serve the poor. Um, I we have a digital media company. We basically develop brands for visionary leaders um, and execute on that. So we're an award winning media company, and I do performance coaching for high achievers. And the reason I do that is pretty obvious, right? I'm one of them. 
And I think all people that have this aspiration, that drive, tend to have a very similar set of assets to work in their favor and also a similar set of limitations that limit them. And because I've gone through this journey several times and I started several um, several companies, failed several times as well, um, I help I help them thrive for life, you know, for lack of a better word, I, because it's basically the skill set that allows it to be at the top of the game, um, not only for a short period of time, like a sprint, but really along the, f- the full marathon of life. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, for sure. It's because nothing just happens overnight. As as they say, the overnight success has 10, 20 years of, of hard work behind them before they actually get noticed. And- always, oh, always. Right. Yes, always. Yeah. So like you you've lived a life of being in front of millions of people saying performing and people are like oh i want to be him i want to be him and i wish that's my dream and all that kind of stuff would you say looking back that was like a dream come true for you it was uh-huh it was and and there was wonderful things about it and there were disappointing things about it right uh but it was it was absolutely surreal and i i really hope that everybody has a version of that story mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be millions it doesn't have to be music it doesn't even have to be very public but this idea that something you do is so engaging and so attractive to people that people really want more of it mm-hmm. you know and that's basically it's really not about the scale but you know the feeling of you you know sitting in your kitchen writing songs I was working with this my my producer sort of partner creating this beats these arrangements and the sound the specific sound and listening to endless sort of tracks by other artists that inspired us and then we were very bad you know and then it got better and then it got better and then you know you 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 get the rejection you get the you know who are you anyway that kind of thing right you you're broke all the time and then all of a sudden these these little snippets of art that you put together that you didn't never know would never knew you would see the light of day are chanted back to you by you know a crowd of 10 15,000 people i mean there's just nothing more validating than that right right now in entrepreneurship and in business lots of people goes well i had the best product the quality of my product is great. A lot of artists out there are saying, hey, my 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 songs are great. My lyrics are great. My music is great. How come I'm not getting noticed? You mentioned before that you did a whole bunch of stuff and people are rejecting it and you're not, you're finding your path. What is it that got you over that hump of actually getting noticed? Because sometimes it's not the skill, it's not the quality, but it's something else that gets you over the top. And then it's supported by the skill, the quality. Yes, it's it's consistency, I would say, that translates over the long haul, it translates into this new level of, of excellence, mm-hmm. of mastery. Um, because yes, in the moment, you think your product, your software, your service, your song, your book is... I mean, that's why you did it, because you think it's, all, you think it's awesome. Well, the, pro- the problem with that is, there's two problems with that. One is... A lot of people might disagree and not want it. B, not enough people have seen it. <laughs> so one is, what is the reality of, of you know, product market fit, for, for lack of a better word? And then the second part is, how do you l- let it, let more people know? Now, if if your product and song and, uh, and, and book are just insufficiently excellent, uh, even if many people see it, it, it it's not going to make a difference, mm-hmm. basically, right? But if it is excellent, um, it is going to make a difference. And then consistency and grit and the ability to sort of stay on course um, is is the key to success. You mentioned that you failed many times before. What was what was the thing that kept you going? What meant you go, you know what? Yeah, that's a failure. It didn't work out. I'll try something else. Like that always getting up and pushing forward and doing something else until you get to where you want to be. That's a very good question. And I would say um, the answer will always be sort of this 
you know, it's not a cliche, it's, a, it's true, but it is a cliche because it is true and everybody says it, is everybody's going to go, well, you have a positive mindset, you v visualize, you do this, you do that. Uh, and it's all true, right? Mindset, mindset is what changes your reality over time. But honestly, it's your ability to change who you are, your character. You know, no, no, no amount of encouragement, visualizations, you know, burning incense, you know, manifesting things will, will change reality. You know, it's it's just that's not it's just not how it works. The mindset helps you change your character, but you have to change. If you don't change, nothing will change. And I think sort of that's where I cut through the sort of the normal list of things that I can, you know, I can, I can regurgitate that to you as well, right? You know, meditation, contemplation, uh, you know, be in physical shape, et cetera, et cetera. Like everybody knows the list in the same way that, in the same way that any, if you want to get in shape, any gym you go to, any personal trainer you're going to, you go to, they're going to tell you the same thing, you know, eat less, eat healthier, move more. That's it. It's uncomplicated. Right. So, and we just go from fad to fad, from myth to myth, from, you know, from magic formula to magic formula, it never changes. Why does it not change, even though the formula is so, so clear and uncomplicated? It's because we don't change. Mm -hmm. So the secret is you have to change. Mm -hmm. No, you have to change. One of the one of the challenges that lots of people have when it comes to that aspect, and I totally agree that change is important. If you want to grow, you need to change. If you want to achieve something, you need to change. However, there's that period of time where people go, well, that's not me. I don't feel authentic anymore. Like the whole saying, fake it till you make it or act like you're be you belong. There's yeah. a little bit of truth of that because you need to do it, change yeah. to be yeah. part of that. Yeah, yeah. And then people go, well, I feel fake. I feel inauthentic. I don't think people would, would, would like me if I'm not me. So how do people navigate through that thought process that, okay, yeah, it's a little bit different, but it's not inauthentic. It's you adjusting. Yeah. You have to stretch. Bottom line, you have to you have to go beyond your present reality, and you have to change your personality. Basically, you know, and it, it's very gradual. And and look, if you're not willing to be uncomfortable all the time, like personally uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you will not succeed. It's just true, and it's true of me as well. Like I've I've had periods where I mean, a business failed just because I was so I had a certain amount of expertise that made a profitable business. And I was, I had some more freedom. I had choices, and I did not make myself uncomfortable to de-risk it, to diversify the market, for example, and to build up a team. And then one thing failed, and the whole thing came, came crashing down. Why? Because I didn't change. That's it. Like it's not that I was a bad bad at what I do. I was actually very good at what I do. But business is complicated, right? It's nuanced. Mm -hmm. So if you don't change and you don't get beyond your comfort zone all the time, like daily. Mm. Uh, you, you won't have even the ability to detect the risk, detect the threat, and even detect the downfall initially, you know? So yeah, you have to learn how to be very uncomfortable all the time and then somehow attach meaning and excitement to it. And I think that's basically the deal. And, and, and I think that's, it's not that the philosophies and the teachings that we hear from all the best people are wrong. They're not wrong at all. It's just people just don't do it. <laughs> so that's that simple. Yeah. So sometimes like common sense is not that common. People, if you ask anybody, how do you fix this? How do you change this? How do you become yeah. better? They always give you the right answers. And they yeah. go, how come you're not doing it? Kind of thing. Um, you mentioned about risk, you mentioned about the unknowns and how to get comfortable with those unknowns, how to get comfortable with, with risk assessment mm -hmm. is something that people need to be more accustomed to so that they're able to change. What would you say to people who are not that risk averse or not that fear averse? What's something that they could do on a daily basis to kind of expand their ability to look at risk differently or look at fear differently? Well, there's two, according to some sources, there's two core foundational human needs is the need the need for certainty right and safety and the need for uncertainty which is variety right? both of both of both of those things are 
foundational core needs. So we sort of vacillate between, hey, if, that, if everything is super certain, then we get bored. Um, if, if we if everything gets super uncertain, we get fearful, basically, right? That's that's the bottom line. I find that in, especially in the United States or in first world countries, I should say, where there's so much safety, so much um, prosperity, so much stability, relatively speaking to, I don't know, 80% of the world, that the the biggest weakness of entrepreneurs in the United States is that they any change from basic, from your normal certainty is perceived as as high, high risk. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who grew up overseas, you know, if, if you come from the third world, you look at that and you go, really, that's high risk for you? That's nothing, okay? So in, in that sense, I think immigrants have a higher advantage. People that are driven who are immigrants have a massive advantage over sort of the, the indigenous American comfortable um, entrepreneur because they know for them, the risk that it seems high to him is not, high for them, right? So, okay, so what, what do you do then? If you're an American, you were born and bred, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, you create, instead of suffering from destructive uncertainty, destructive change that will always happen if you're passive and you don't, don't change, you're basically reaping the consequences of your passivity. It could be financial, emotional, relational, business, et cetera. You create constructive stress, constructive hardship. And you do that by by starting something new and experimenting at the margins in a way that doesn't destroy you, but actually makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. So like in a very practical way, what that would look like is, hey, get a stable job, lower your overhead and have a side gig that is more high risk, but it's not going to kill you if the side gig doesn't go well quickly, but they, because they never do, because you have a main source of income. But you always do something on the edges that is risky. Always do that because that's going to give. That's going to sort of bleed into your character, who you are. You'll experiment more, but you're going to live long enough to actually succeed in that. Because if you make it make it your whole thing, it's just too risky. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, very very true. And it's it's also those small steps. You don't want to jump and take that big risk right off the bat. You want to take little risks and kind of get more comfortable with that and grow from there. Um, you work with some really top performers from uh, Olympians to big CEOs and entrepreneurs, yet they still come to you because of performance. Yeah. What are some of the things that you have seen in common with already top, perform top performers that they're lacking that you go in and go, oh, you tweak this or you change that for them to reach that elite level? I would say this. I would say, first of all, if you want to go to just good to great, you need to figure out a lifestyle that doesn't deplete you. Um, if you, if like you mentioned, Olympic level athletes, elite athletes, no, no elite athlete ever competes in a depleted state. Did you notice that? Yeah. No, of course not. They will eat well. They will rest well. They will sleep well. They will train in a way that builds them up, but doesn't deplete them too much. And when they are ready to compete, they're in peak state, you know? And that somehow is not translated in the business world. So that that whole thing of burning, burning the candle on both ends, you know, in startup hustle mode type stuff, right? I think it, it has some merits because you want to fail quickly, you want to make experiments. In the long run, it doesn't work at all because you can't really think straight when you're depleted. So what I help people do is create a lifestyle, a rhythm, daily rhythm, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, that allows them to be at peak performance at a much higher percentage of, of their lives than, than they are used to because they just haven't made the adjustments yet. You know, So that's one piece. It's sort of peak performance ongoing, right? How do you maintain that as much as possible? Now, you, you won't succeed 100%, but if your baseline is elevated, let's say you have, instead of having peak performance for two hours a day, which is sort of normal, mm -hmm. you have peak performance for five hours a day. How is that going to change your week? Massively, absolutely massively. You know, If you have four days out of the week that are just extraordinarily productive, creative, change-making, instead of like two, is that going to change 
the very essence of how you do things, et cetera, et cetera. You can't even measure it. It's going to multiply it, right? So that's probably one aspect is being at peak performance all the time or the majority of the time, right? Realistically. The other thing that people I find in common that high achievers, because they're so driven about the, their their craft, their mission, their mastery, whatever, whatever that they're, drives them, they tend to overinvest in this one narrow area and underinvest in other areas that will make them healthy, wealthy, successful, and live longer in the long run. And there's really great science around it. Uh, so there's research, you know, I based my stuff on the Harvard research of, of, of human development. And it's very clear, for example, that you will be wealthier, healthier, and live longer if you have a spiritual dimension to your life, if you have close family relationships, if you have deep friendships, and you have meaningful work, those four things. High achievers do really good with meaningful work. The work is very meaningful to them, and they tend to be terrible at the first three. You know, and and that that really limits them. So they can go for an X amount of months and years. Eventually, that catches up with them, and the lack of dimensionality or holistic success um, actually starts limiting the one thing that they invest in in the first place. You know, so it sort of backfires. Mm -hmm. So, is there such thing as work life balance then? No, it's work life integration. I don't think there's such a thing as work life balance. Mm -hmm. What would uh, what would you say to people who are, are 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 trying to find that that right combination of of paying attention to a little bit of everything? Because when you're saying okay, you're gonna have peak performance four days out of out of seven or five hours versus two hours. Okay, now they're thinking okay, I could work more, I could work more, work more. How do they divide their mind so they go okay, well? I need to spend some time here. Oh, I need to spend some time on the wealth stuff or the health stuff or the family stuff. Yeah. Like you did, you say there's no such thing as work-life balance, but how do you get that to be holistic? Yeah, it's a it's a tapestry. You know, it's you weave those threads in and they have to be valuable for you in the first place, right? And um, so for example, for me, I will do I will do creative work in the morning. So uh, this is my formula. Right? I do probably two, three hours of pure creation, writing, recording, something like that, right? Sh creating a copy for a, for, a, for a client on the media side, something like that, writing a book, two, three hours minimum every single day. I do contemplation and prayer. I do physical, physical um, exercise once a day minimum. It would probably be resistance training and then a long walk, mm -hmm. right? Most, most days it's gonna be that. So I'm going to kiss my wife and talk to her minimum three, four times a day, five times a day. I'm with her, around her all the time, all the time. I'm not the guy who just leaves the house and then when she's asleep and then comes back and we just have dinner tired and then we'll go to bed. It just doesn't work. You know, you can't build a marriage like that. No way. You know, now you can make a, a few million dollars more if you do that for five, six years, but then you're going to have, you're going to be on your third startup on your third divorce. Mm -hmm. To me, that doesn't work. I think statistically the data shows that doesn't work either actually for anybody. I don't think it's a good price. It's a fair price. It's terrible price and irreversible by the way, where you have, you know, three, I have three daughters. And if you've made millions, became this massive star in anything, and then your kids resent you. That's irreversible. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely 100% the most valuable thing you have. Right. So it's, you know, what do you do? Well, I integrate. I have daddy dates with my daughters. I call them. They text me. We have all these systems where my life is weaved into theirs and theirs into mine, you know? Uh, same thing with deep friendships. It takes a all, long time to grow an old friend. Right. There are no shortcuts. And I'm not talking deal friends. I'm talking real friends, right? It's not coworkers, you know, geeking out over a, a seed round at a startup. These are people that know me, trust me, love me. Tr they know my faults and my weaknesses. They know where I want to go. They see around corners and can prevent me from doing stupid things. It takes incredible amounts of effort to nurture that kind of friendship, right? So 
beginning the, with the dimensionality and ending with literally how the day goes, right? That I take certain breaks, I, I batch tasks in groups, I do creative work in the morning, communication work at the in the in the evening, in the afternoon. So I have all these all these systems, right, that create a a life where I can handle building something new. I can handle the stress, I can handle the failure and be sort of a peak performance creative a pretty much a, a, a large proportion of the time and exude joy, happiness, confidence to the people I speak to because people won't want to work with you if you're down, depressed, doubtful, and insecure. They just won't want to work with you. They're not going to give you their money. They're not going to give you their investment. They're not going to become your partners. So that's sort of the beauty of creating a high-performance life. And um, it takes quite a bit of effort. It takes mentorship. It takes community, accountability, all those things. You mentioned before about uh, peak performers don't, don't perform when they're depleted. And you also talked about how people don't want to be with you if you're depleted and not yeah. happy and all that kind of stuff. However, on a day-to-day -day basis, we're inundated with so much negative stuff whether that's from media or from people around us, how do you navigate through negativity? Because uh, social media has comments and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, that you may have 10 good comments, but that one bad comment, oh man. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's terrible, yeah. So, so how do you navigate through that? And I'm sure you've, you've faced negativity before. Yeah, oh, absolutely, terrible things. People write, ter especially if, when I was in my sort of pop star days, uh, people literally make up lies and publish them, you know, in publications. <laughs> it's just, and you'll read that kind of thing and you go, you, I don't even know you. You have never spoken to me. I don't understand how you came up with the story, right? But, you know, lies sell, outrage sells, negativity sells. That's just the, mo the business model of media in wow. general, but especially with social media, uh, where the it's basically all attention grabbing stuff, right? Uh, I would say, a few principles from my perspective is I don't follow the news at all. I follow the news maybe every month. For example, this season, I'm watching the presidential debates, but I'm not checking the news and updates in between those two things. I just don't because it, it really, it's almost like a jamming station to creativity. Like it really interferes with creative thinking, with possibility, all of those things. Um, I don't read social media. I write social media. That's another principle, mm -hmm. right? So I don't read a lot of posts online. I write a lot of posts online. <laughs> I broadcast rather than consume. I create rather than consume. Uh, I have on X, X is probably the only platform that I that I read every day, but it's an incredibly curated a list of thinkers and thought leaders that I admire. I know that there's no junk, there's zero junk. Mm -hmm. So if you can curate and create a, a, a social media environment that only gives you the best of the best, the highest quality thinking, that's a great way. That's a great thing to consume because it enriches you mm -hmm. rather than distracts you. Right. Now you mentioned how you create the posts for social media in in your creativity process, do you consider cancel culture? Do you are you afraid of what you're posting, or do you post what you think? I am. I'm not in a space per se where cancel culture is a danger. To be honest with you, um, luckily I'm not a politician. Like I don't have these high stake things that people even have levers to cancel me in, in any significant way. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that you can be completely immune. No one is completely immune. I would say that in general, I have. I'm very. Av I don't believe in it. I think it's a. It's a terrible. Um. It's a terrible trend, and I am one of the people that pushes back and says, "Look, I'm going to say what I believe. Authenticity is more important, and I think it carries you in the long run." than um, the than living in some sort of fear and sort of this, I mean, the response to cancel culture, if you're fearful of it, is a political correctness, essentially. Right. Uh, political correctness, the word was invented by the Soviets 
And I grew up in the Soviet Union, so I have a massive aversion against Marxism, against government overreach, against tyranny in general, against basically any any form of tyranny. It doesn't matter if in the, if it's on the left or on the right. So political correctness is basically a culture, an environment where someone is the curator of virtue of the things to say and to think, and you have to conform to that someone's approval of virtue and what to think and not to think. And that is just, that's an evil thought, evil thought. It just, I don't think you can flourish if you're afraid of anything, as a matter of fact, but especially if you're afraid of cancel culture and if you're a public person, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't, you can't be really truly authentically yourself mm -hmm. because there's going to be always someone who thinks you're an idiot and shouldn't, shouldn't be listened to, you know, so mm -hmm. what? Right. Uh, you talked about creative creativity a lot, and it really drives your success. There's a lot of people out there who goes, creativity, I have zero ounce of creativity. What do you say to people like that? And if they wanted to, how do you curate creativity? How do you help them find their creativity? They are They are completely wrong. Everybody's creative. And I can prove it to you, as a matter of fact. So if you go into a classroom of seven-year-olds, and you give them pieces of paper and crayons and say, create, create, what do you see the universe as being? Or create the most beautiful meadow, right? All of them will be artists, every single one of them. You walk into the same classroom when they're 16, 17, 18, you ask for the same thing. Maybe a third of them, maybe a fifth of them will do what you say with excitement. Most of the other ones are going to be rolling their eyes and you know not doing anything. And the reason for that is that between 7 and 17, we educate the creativity out of them because we teach people just to conform, you know? So, and, and unfortunately, the education model is partially to blame for that because it's a post-industrial um, education model. And the other thing is really fear, fear of acceptance, all those things, right? So in if you want to be successful... You have to divorce your identity from being a cog in the machine, mm -hmm. from fitting in, basically. And a creative person is able to create something out of nothing, overcoming possible rejection, early rejection, critique, overcoming uh, imposter syndrome, which all of us have that, right? So you have to, again, remember how I said, unless you change, nothing will change. You have to change. First of all, you are a creative person, but you do have to change into a creative person. Rediscover the creativity within you. Like one of my clients, I just interviewed him uh, just recently on my podcast. One of the things he said, we weren't even focusing on that. He's a young guy in his 30s. He's in commercial real estate. And... He said, you know, Christian, what happened? It just struck me. He goes, I started writing songs for the first time when I was in your program. Just like that. Mm -hmm. And it, and he said, I always, I always thought myself as a creative person, but somehow I didn't do it. And now I am. And to me, that's the secret is everybody's creative. You have to change who you are. You have to rediscover that, you know, because you've been taught out of it. And then once you discover creativity, you will create new businesses, new products, new services, new art, all of it. Awesome. Now, I know you work with a lot of individuals, uh, coaching them, helping them succeed. But I also know that in order for you to get to where you are today, you are surrounded by a lot of individuals who helped you get to you to where you are today. What were some of the most like thought-provoking or life-changing advices that they've given you to get you over certain humps or challenges? Oh, there was a lot of that. Uh, I was, I've been very fortunate, I think, but I also have taken up taking, I have not, I've tried to not miss those opportunities to be around people who are wiser than I am. So I think the first one that really strikes me uh, was I was at the peak of my music career and I was tanking in my love life. And I was just really terrible at it, basically. And this one guy who was a pastor in the church, he, you know, I, I was in his kitchen, we're having dinner, and he has this 
incredible loving family. And I honestly didn't know how to build that. And I said, can you teach me how to do that? And he goes, yeah. And I, and he, he was brave enough to speak truth and love when I did tell me things I didn't want to hear. And I was humble enough to actually accept them. Right. So that was a big one. And I think in any weakness, people are going to tell you things you don't want to hear. And you have to a find people who will actually tell you something that you don't want to hear and they have expertise in that, but also find the humility to actually listen and do something about it. Mm -hmm. I think another one was very interesting is I was interviewing, um, I had a production company. We did music and music videos and music production in Hollywood. And I became friends with one of my childhood icons. He was, his name was George Duke. He's passed away since. And he's like a Grammy Award winning legend, musician, producer, all of that. So I, I was interviewing him and I said, what is, you, you, you worked with just some of the biggest names on the planet. What is a common thread in all of them? And I thought, because I'm an artist and I've been successful, I'm like hard work, talent, charisma, whatever. Like I had a long list in my brain of things that he could say. And he says, you know, I think what I, the the most important thing I found them to have is imagination. They Not about just life, but about themselves. They could imagine themselves. They can see themselves succeeding. And to me, that was a big insight. And I think it's true. I think if you can't really clearly picture your future in three or five years, uh -huh it's going to be hard to hit that future to experience it. And so one of the things that we do at Exponential is really, really create a vision for the future that is 3D, HD, you know, ultra HD in a lot of detail because you can hold on to that and that vision will, will shape the way the decisions you make, the things you say no to, things like that. Um, the other one, I think the third one, I, I mean, I've, I have, I've had many, I've been very fortunate but working with um, one of my business partners in Third Drive in this company that also does consulting for founders in, in tech was just meeting my my friend, uh, Brandon Nicely, who is this IBM trained engineer. He did a lot of capital raising in, in Silicon Valley. He built a billion dollar telecommunications company in the 90s in New York and done a lot of things. And just being around him, observing the the texture and the the terminology and the dynamics of the startup world to me that was just massively um just a massive period of growth just being in meetings around him where i, I you know we partner up so we would do i would do the storytelling the digital media the brand development for these people and he would advise them on how to raise capital how to pitch all of those things how to structure deals so i would be in those meetings and then in, I remember I really wanted to be around him because I wanted to learn that world. So in the beginning, I was I could barely understand twenty percent of what he was saying, you know, <laughs> you know. And and now I not only understand all of it, maybe not to the degree that he does, mm. but I can very confidently talk about most of the topics in in startup tech startup world, things like that. And that really helps me even coach people in that space, right? Because I know their world a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, something else that you're doing now is you're you're giving back to the community. You're you're doing a lot of philanthropic work. Uh, share with us more about that journey for you and uh, how people get get involved with that. So if you go to a website called Ascend, like going up, ascending, ascend .academy, you will find um, it's a very small project. It's a it's a passion project. And it's basically this after school academy for very, very poor kids in Mozambique. It's one of the poorest countries in the world that live sort of in the slums of Maputo, which is the capital. So we select a few of them and we put them in a place where they go to school. Thankfully, the government provides them schooling with schooling. But then they go for three, four hours a day into this, into this academy where they have people that they would never be normally around middle-class professionals who mentor them in character and vision um, in, in sort of how to see themselves and, and the world. They get mentorship in computer literacy and in English. None of those things are available to them where they are or even in their school. So that's basically was born out of, you know, 20 something years of philanthropic work. I've done it for a long time. And I sort of landed on that model as an entrepreneur because I think entrepreneurs really lean towards, Hey, 
I would rather teach you how to fish than to just give you fish. And that's basically the formula here with these kids. And my idea is to get them out of poverty by maybe age 17, 18. They will not only be out of poverty on, on their own merit, but also get their families out of poverty and give back eventually. So, and the journey to that, it was just, I grew up there. I grew up in Mozambique. It's from seven to 14. So I have very personal, very deep personal memories of the beauty of the people, how just incredible that that area is, but also the poverty. And eventually I sort of latched onto that idea as a, when I became successful as an artist, I, I started collaborating with this organization. We would, di- would do these big concerts for orphans, like 3,000 orphans. And um, they, they would just, they would look forward to these concerts every single year. They just, that was the highlight of the year. And we could see the impact on them. We could see the impact at scale. And uh, Michael Jackson came to one of our events and it was just surreal because he was one of my big heroes. And um, and then when I'm, we moved to the States, I was VP of this big charity for a few years, precisely because I wanted to learn on a high level, how did the nonprofit world works? And I also learned from it what I don't want to imitate, you know, and how I can probably innovate combining sort of the classic model with entrepreneurship as sort of what runs in my veins, right? Awesome. Well, that's uh, amazing, amazing work. And hopefully everybody gets in touch with you on on that and uh, find out more ways to get involved. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Um, let's say if you had one message to to share with everybody and for some everybody to remember you for, what would that message be? I would say that you are born for a purpose that is very, very specific to you, very unique to you, whether you believe it or not. And really the goal in life is to find that purpose and live it out with your whole heart. Um, I think too many people accept the status quo. They don't question the status quo and they settle for safety and they miss out on just a very joyful creative, successful, impactful life that they can live not only for a short period of time, but they can live forever, you know, for, for the rest of their lives, even into the, into old age. And I just, I believe that about myself. I've been able to live it out. It's not easy. It takes, you know, it takes a lot of intentionality and, um, but I really believe this is accessible to anybody who is willing to, to go on the journey. Awesome. Great words to live by. Uh, that concludes our formal por- portion of the interview. I got five quick rapid fire questions to- for you. Give me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. You're stranded on a deserted island. One food to eat for the rest of your life. No consequence. Mangoes. Great choice. You're on a road trip. You get to pick three people to sit on this road trip with you. Dead or alive, your idols, who would they be? My wife. Jesus, Solomon, King Solomon. <laughs> Very good choices. Now, there's only one song that plays on this hours on hours on end trip. What's that one song you want everybody to be singing all the way there? Wow, that's a hard one. <laughs> one of your own. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm too critical <laughs> of myself. Okay, let's just pick Purple Rain by Prince. Nicely done. Um, you get to win the gold medal in anything that you want. What would that be? Impact. Impact. And then finally, give me a number from one to four. One. Number one. So if you had to use pancakes as a metaphor for success, how is success like pancakes? Success is like pancakes because it only works depending on the toppings you choose. Yeah, does that work? (laughs) So that's how success is like pancakes. Um, Thank you very much for for your time, Uh, your your stories, your your nuggets of wisdom. It's it's been a pleasure hearing all that from you and always uh, chatting with people like yourself. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Can I give your audience a gift? Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that we do at Exponential is really evaluate where people are. And we've developed this tool that is based, essentially derived, I would say, from the Harvard study of, of, um, of adult development. 
and it's called the exponential score. It's it's a scorecard. So if you go to uh, dot 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 expo uh, www dot exponential without the e starting with an x uh, dot life slash score or just go to the homepage, you'll see a button, and it basically takes you through these I think forty questions that are really the most relevant, the most important questions for human flourishing. You get a report in your inbox and it's either orange, red, you know, orange for medium, red for bad, green for great. And it's a great way to get the vitals of your life, right? What are the most important things? How are you doing? So you can make some decisions based out of it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that. I'll make sure everybody gets that link. Um, much appreciated again for, for your time. Any final words from you? Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, it's an honor, honestly, to to be able to speak to people and, and just have their attention, their time, their energy, um, and be able to share whatever nuggets that can be useful to you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. For everybody, he's Christian. Make sure you uh, connect with him and also do that score scorecard. It's going to be very, very uh, beneficial to, to everybody out there. So once again, thank you. My name is Fong. He's Christian. Until next time, today is the day to lock your peak potential. We'll see you later.